Should I buy it? Should I save my money? I'm going to another country. I should probably save my money. But I was... The power of literature? Insane sometimes. <laughs> Hi, hello. We're going into the city right now to get a haircut. I know, I'm insane. It's not even that bad. But I'm going to Japan next weekend, yes, again. And I, I just need a little trim, just a little trim because I, I don't want to look like a buffoon in another city. So that's, that's what we're doing. We're being a little extra today. Just spent the entire morning, afternoon doing a bit of like work and a few calls have been made, but this is a fit. Um, I'm gonna tuck this in. Sorry, it's untucked. We just need a little breathing room. You know what I mean? Cute little black blazer. I don't know if you can see very clearly, but it's like a crescent shape, the pocket. A fun little shirt, a turtleneck, and uh, some washed out jeans. Back of the day is taking this little cutie out. My energy comes from freedom. Comme de Garçon and The Met. Haven't worn this in a while. And book of the day is my Emily Dickinson. We're having a little poetry fix because apparently April is the month for poetry. So very much enjoying Susan Howe's look at Emily Dickinson's work. I've never been a really big Emily Dickinson person. So this is a really nice analysis of her work from a feminist viewpoint in a very menaced colonial time that she had written some of her poetry in. So enjoying this very much. Let's go. It's your boy Nate. I read books because reading is sexy, and if you're not reading, you're not sexy. Sorry if the vlog footage has been weird. Yesterday, I was on a time crunch. I went into the city to get a haircut. Thank you, thank you. Yes, it's great. Love it. I I think I'm um, pretty bad at book updates right now. So I was in Osaka last weekend. We finished Open Throat and The Guest by Emma Klein. And to tell you the truth, I really can't tell you anything about The Guest by Emma Klein. Because let me tell you, that was a very forgettable book, sadly. But it's about, but it's about this homeless quote unquote grifter, Alex, who's in her 20s and She's got this thing going on with an older rich dude on an island, but then she leaves the island and then sort of like creates this so new identity for herself and sort of like becomes this nobody and then floats around from man to man as this nobody. It's an incredibly long novel and I believe, well, this was an ARC as in like a, a galley. So it's, it's not edited to its full potential. It needs a bit of trimming. There's just some relationships that she encounters that I don't think totally fulfill the purpose of the book, but I, I was kind of just, I was let down. I was let down by this, uh, given that I really wanted to read Daddy, just because of the cover of Alone. And the cover of this is great too. It's a nice striking electric blue with green and it's fine. If anything, I think this is just if you've got the time, 
in a long summer to just read this at the beach, on a cruise, on train rides, between seeing people, be in commutes, that kind of thing. And it's just a fun little ride of navigating towards finding your own identity if it's possible to sort of like reset. We've all, we've all had that feeling, you know? We want to reset sometimes and just become a completely different person. Start from scratch, clean slate, all those things. And this is a long, arduous way of seeing if that's possible. And you know what, by the end, I, <laughs> I don't even remember the end. A big yawn of a book, solid three stars. The end does some sort of theatrical jest in prose that I just don't think worked very well, given that, you know, you have to slug through a lot to get there. And I don't think, um, what is it called? The end isn't worth it. It, it. The end isn't worth it. And sadly, I didn't quite enjoy this. But it is out by Random House, May 16th. This probably <laughs> won't do you any good given that this video will come out in the future. But if you're looking for a sleepy summer, this one's for you. Okay, after that, I read Everything the Darkness Eats, Eric LaRocca is about a small Connecticut town and there's these mysterious disappearances and the story is queer, dark, gothic, and yeah, I was I was sucked in real good. And and then I don't know. By the end I was like, wow, this is this is an all right YA book. Until I looked it up and I was like, oh, it's actually <laughs> meant for adults. Not to drag Eric, but there's this moment near the end of the book where it's really good. It's like really dark and gritty and you're just like, yum, this is good. This is like, this is good stuff, good stuff. Until they use these similes that just don't work with the book at all. There's this moment, like this very gory moment where Eric uses, he thought of such things as he closed his palm tightly and squished the life out of the tiny black slug until it was smeared along the palm of his hand like toothpaste. Having taken a great number of pros and stylist classes, you can't be using similes that are just completely out of place and don't render anything with the rest of your text. Why in God's earth are you using toothpaste as simile in like this dark, grisly, gory scene. It just doesn't make any sense. Like, I, the image of minty fresh should not enter my mind when, you know, someone is being, you know, shred up to bits. You know what I mean? So I noticed that when I was looking back through the book and seeing all of these similes and the overuse of similes, which is why I thought that this was a YA book, because I was just like, oh, this is like very like young adult voice um, meant for a lower level reading, if you will. Th looking at those moments just brought the stars down to about three stars, solid three stars, but this is a B, a B horror movie. And then it just put a bad taste in my mouth because the story is queer, which is great. Like th these things get me excited because I'm just like, ooh, queer people in horror stories? This is, this is it, this is it. But it's it's not there yet. Eric's writing level is not there yet. If anything, I think Tell Me I'm Worthless by Alison Rumfit, which I read last year. A fantastic horror book that's also queer and just does like a fabulous job of mixing the horror elements of the social political realm of the UK. And that's done beautifully, prose as well elevated language. Wonderful. But yeah, if you're looking for a B-horror three-star queer gothic book, this one might be for you. It's a fun one. Like, I had fun. I had fun. But uh, yeah, in the end, it just felt like the victimization of the queer body in the book just went in a direction that didn't sit well with me and didn't offer anything to say, really. And it also got like mildly strange about the critique of religion. And I was just like, where the fuck did this come from? And it's weird. 
but like TLDR, this was cute and all, but Suspiria was better. So yeah, go watch Suspiria and go watch Luca Guadagnino's version of Suspiria, which is essentially is this book. But I mean, I think you can make the argument that Luca Guadagnino's Suspiria is queer. I mean, I think he could have added more queer elements into it and it would have been chef's kiss, but a meek three stars for me, everything the darkness eats. And now I want to read like more horror that'll outdo this, if you will. But yeah, it was fine. It was fine. And then I came back from Japan and I still had this to finish up, Games and Rituals by Catherine Haney by Knopf. It is an ARC. Do you see that? Isn't that beautiful? Thank you, Matt. Matt Sharapa, love you. Fun, fun, delicious little stories. They remind me a lot of the writing of Nora Ephron through humor and drama. So if you like, if you like Nora Ephron, I think you should pick this up. Nothing else more to say. Just really fun, short stories. A good collection, solid. It's definitely a pandemic book. And yeah, the humor is just great in it. And I think what Haney is really good at is creating these sort of beautiful ends that feel hopeful yet melancholy in this like bittersweet way. And uh, yeah, Haney is something you should, you should be looking out for in the future. I wouldn't be surprised if these turn into like one of those like New York I love you, or like Paris I love you, four stories in one movie kind of thing. This is what it's giving, but it's fun. It's fun. Fans of Nora Ephron, pick this up. Games and Rituals, Catherine Haney. And then I realized it's Poetry Month in the month of April. It is April. Um, oh, I should probably tell you the date. It's April 16th. We're halfway through April. And I thought, you know what? Poems, let's, let's give them a go. So I did also Tanya Poems by Brenda Shaughnessy. And these are quite wonderful in that, also to preface, I think it's a bit difficult to talk about poetry because I feel like it just does a disservice to the entire collection. You know what I mean? In the same way I feel about like short stories too. It's just like, I think you have to like look at every single short story to be able to talk about the collection. But to be honest, these felt like episodic uh, little moments, almost like a mini series without any strong connection between any of them. They just like Atlanta, if you will, like season three or two essentially. Looking at the feminist viewpoint of literature itself and creation in th that there's this one poem that I absolutely adored that I think speaks to the rest of the poems, but On Loss of Feathers by Ursula von Reidingsvart, and it examines feminist literature and the importance of female writers in the academic environment and the love for the classroom and the richness one gets from being able to drink up all of this literature and appreciate it and the beauty that it has laid out for Brenda herself as a poet. What I think a lot of these poems are about are about mentorship and sort of the giving thanks to the great elders, if you will, and showing appreciation for the works that have changed us and how literature changes. A beautiful, beautiful collection. They get a bit, I want to say, self-indulgent a bit, but there's a breath in here that shows a lot of appreciation, which I loved. Should we do a reading? I love this moment here. So it's about the narrator meeting this like older woman who's an artist. So I'll, I'll read this for you. Decades ago, the much older woman and artist took my arm and said, look at this strong little arm and marveled, her hand stroking my fingertips to elbow. I was embarrassed. I thought she was envying my young body. Many years later, now that I envy my own young body, I realized she wasn't coveting mine, but finally claiming her own. Delicious, very, very good, strong collection. Brenda has a very strong control of the English language and has a lot of fun with it as well. And it's, it's beautiful, beautifully done. I also did Quiet Poems by Victoria Adukwe Bully. And 
oh, what a very, very strong collection. But they all examine the social issues of the black body, what it encounters from like a microaggression level to macro, and just done so, so beautifully with so much heart. A few to discuss, but I want to read this one for you. It's quite short. About Anna. The truth is nobody knows how Anna Mendieta met her death. It would appear she was pushed some distance below. The doorman said he heard a woman shout no, and then the sound as her body hit the top of the deli so hard her face left a mark like a metal stamp. In the photo, she is naked and feathered. She looks like the first woman, like she doesn't know what a camera is. That somewhere in the world, it is believed that things can steal a soul. Her arms are out as if to say, you move them like this to fly. Like this, see? Her feet are apart. You can see the sphere of her hips, the delta between her legs. I look at her, sated, and think this is the true work of the body, to adorn itself and be comfortable, unaware. I myself am bored of fig leaves, of shames I did not choose. So beautifully done. There's this energetic rhythm, this almost like striving to become a soul through every line and beat in her poems that just make her writing so delicious and also has a very strong control of the English language in its acrobatics and movements. There's there's almost bone structure within her prose and it's absolutely wonderful. And I examined that closely with uh, through this poem called Noise. So the poem is um, about noise, but in between noises are these like gaps. And as I was reading it, this magical thing occurred where these blank spaces had a sound and then like the sound built up and that it wasn't just like, cause I, I first read it in my head and as my head was like creating these spaces, as you do with like a comma perhaps, just because of this, these little negative spaces, I was reading in my head, but then I was realizing like my breathing changed and I was creating these negative spaces with the sound of my own breath. And then I decided, what if I read them aloud? And so when I read it aloud and the way that like my voice stopped before and after every single negative space, the negative space in the real world developed this almost pause button, the super quick pause button, as if I could, you know, stop a second of the world. It was just this like really beautiful experience. And it sounds absolutely bonkers, but let me tell you, the power of literature, insane sometimes, insane. And this one was just absolutely beautiful. Bully plays a lot with uh, the form of poetry um, through negative space, spacing, and also the absence of space and words blacked out as well. Like, I, like this. This one's called Black Noise. And there it is. Noise as black. Blacking words out to create this fractured poem. Absolutely brilliant. I, I enjoyed this collection a lot. Very, very good. Yes. Quiet. Victoria Bully. And then, to continue with the poetry kick, I decided to pick up My Emily Dickinson by Susan Howe, gifted to me by lovely Biblio Sophie, so merci. Très beau. It examines her work from a almost feminist outburst and retaliation against all of these colonial men that were just like, giving a lot of shit to Emily Dickinson for her fucking dashes. And I was just like, what the fuck is wrong with y'all? Like, fuck y'all conformists. Like, it's odd. Like, when I think about, like, like, Cezanne, okay? He, he painted fucking fruit. And then when people looked at the fruit and they're like, ugh, what is that? I was just like, did people really? <laughs> like, I don't know. Like, when I when I think of, like, people who, who broke art, essentially, say like um, the Impressionists or uh, Jo Miro or any of these artists that like decided to abstract the actual, did people like retaliate and like, what the fuck is that? And I don't know, I just think it's, it's kind of hilarious that 
they weren't able to abstract things yet and had to see things so clearly in defined forms and shapes, which is kind of funny. And yeah, that's exactly what was happening here. And what's really interesting is that, you know, history's weird. Like, I, I never remember how... I always forget that, like, you know, we're all on the same timeline, right? But we all experience different histories, if that makes any sense. But, like, it still boggles my mind. Like, um, my friend Hajin was telling me about this uh, a few weeks ago. But, like, but like Anne Frank, MLK, Barbara Walters, they were all born the same year. It's fucking weird, isn't it? I'm just like, what is that? But did you know Emily Dickinson was um, around the time that Lincoln was assassinated? Like, what did she make of that? What did she think of that? Insane. But closely examines Emily Dickinson's poems with so much earnestness and attention and care. Major TLC. Howe's prose is just so exquisite, like way too delectable. It, there's just so much love. There's so much love in the way Howe examines Dickinson's poems so closely from almost like a very deep academic sense, but also as like poetry is a humane form of souls speaking to souls kind of thing. There's a lot of spirituality in it as well. And it's just so, so beautifully done. Um, some of the things in here went over my head because I think Susan Howe's voice is a bit too academic for me, but this this is really good. If and also I've never read any Emily Dickinson, so this was sort of my introduction to her work. And what a beautiful introduction! I, I want to read more Dick, uh, Dickinson, but Susan Howe's prose is just like up there. You know, it's good. It's it's really good. Um, definitely requires a reread, but. There's a lot of Shakespeare in here too. Didn't realize that Shakespeare played a huge part on Dickinson. And ooh, ooh, I, I bookmarked this part here because I thought it was great. But the Brontes, the Brontes are mentioned in here. And let me tell you, Emily Jane Bronte died of consumption when she was only 30. The calendar called it Tuesday, the 19th of December, 1848, birth of the festival of winter. On Monday, the 18th, Charlotte had read to her from Emerson's essays. I read on till I found she was not listening. Isn't that crazy? Like, a Bronte sister reading to her dying Bronte and continued reading until she realized that her sister wasn't listening anymore. Oh, what a, like, this sad, poetic, literary way to die. Or to, like, experience someone else's passing. Solid four stars. But yes, good for uh, Poetry Month. Okay, and as far as what I'm reading now, we are still on the poetry kick. I am reading an ARC of Ben Lerner's The Lights. I'm about halfway through it. Oh no, I'm about 30% of the way through. And it's, it's interesting. It reminds me of a Philip Glass song or a Zaha Hadid building in that within every sentence, there is an extra layer of meaning and in the next one is another layer of meaning. So I, it, what it feels like is that I'm in this sort of prism of prose and ideas circling around the naturalness of the world and how it exists within our digital age. And I'll leave it at that for now because there's still some thoughts that I have to mull over. But I went to Kyobo yesterday, which is sort of the Barnes and Nobles of Korea, if you will and I did some damage. I shouldn't have, but I did. And this is awful, but let me show you. Let me show you the awful things that I did because I really should be saving money. Yet here I am, spending it. So I saw Kieran from Kieran Reader, our favorite booktuber, read Whale by Chon Yong Kwan. And from what she had told me, it's almost very fantastical. And I think it's a booker finalist, right? Am I right? Yeah, I just love this cover. It's insanely great, isn't it? Look, it's a whale. And look, there's a little person there. Uh, yeah, she, she described it as fantastical. I think fantasism, these outbursts of what appear to be magic in the mundane is something that I want to look at for spring and summer 
and maybe I'll create another video for that, maybe, but so we picked this up and I didn't realize how thick it was. So I'm kind of wary about it though. It's like 366 pages. And okay, I decided to do some, some uh, digging in that I was very interested in translation after I'd read Greek Lessons by Han Gong. And yeah, just like the whole controversy about the translation of Han Gong's work by, by Deborah Smith really got me interested in what translation is and what's that thing called? It's either translation as adaptation or translation as like, as adaptation or advocation? Is that what I'm trying to say? Someone correct me. But yeah, what is adaptation and what is translation? What is a true translation, if you will? So I was thinking a lot about Anton Herr and I really liked his translation of I Wanna Die But I Wanna Eat Tteokbokki by Bexhehi, which is translated by Anton Herr. And that was a really good translation. Bad book, good translation. And yeah, I wanted to look at more of his work. So we picked up, and I've been avoiding this book for so long, I don't know why, don't ask me why, but it's Love in the Big City by Sang Yong Pak. And I don't know, I don't know why I avoided this for so long. Maybe because I'm scared of how the queer body is represented in literature in contemporary Korea because I live in Korea. Maybe that's why. Partially because maybe I won't agree with it. I'm not sure. I'm not sure, okay? Hesitations, doubts, skepticisms. That's what it all is. But I finally picked it up. I picked it up and I just love this cover. Also, I picked it up because of what the fuck is his name? Jack Edwards read it in Korea. And I was just like, you know what? I need to be, I need to stop shaming myself for wanting to read Korean literature in English in Korea. Cause I had this thing. I was like, I don't want to read translated work and like everyone knowing that like, I can't read Korean. Like it's fun, like my Korean, I can't like read Korean literature. I'm like not at that level. I can like look at a poem and like sort of like dissect each line, but it'll take me a long time. But you know, like my Korean is not great. It's like, it's fine. I can get around, but like I can't talk about literature. Like my Korean isn't that good enough for that. So yes, we picked up Love in the Big City. This is about Young, a cynical yet fun-loving Korean student who pinballs from home to class to the beds of recent Tinder matches. He and Jaehee, his female best friend and roommate, frequent nearby bars where they suppress their anxieties about their love lives, families, and money with rounds of soju and freezer-chilled Marlboro Reds. Sounds pretty accurate. I know that bunch quite well. Love in the Big City. Love this cover. Can't wait to read it. And Anton Her recently translated another book and I, I wanted to pick it up. I wanted to see. I went to see My Father by Kyung Suk Shin. And yeah, I don't know, just a really darling cover. Really cute, minimalist. And I, I wanted to see how he translated like queer literature, but also something to this extent, which, what is this about? Soon after losing her daughter in a tragic accident, Hon returns to her childhood home in the Korean countryside to care for her elderly and withdrawn father. There, the discovery of a chest of letters spurs Han towards piecing together the story of his life. And I have to read you this bit because I aghast when I read this, which I think is sort of this tiny little foreword to the book. But some time ago, when I told my father I would write about him, he replied, but what have I ever done with this life? You've done so much, I said. I've done nothing at all, he sighed. All I've done is live through it. I don't know, I thought that was so beautiful. Uh, I wanted to take a look at this because this feels like a very strong narrative masterpiece. This feels like good lit fic, if you know what I mean. So yeah, pick that up. Lastly, we just talked about Hong Kong, but I was interested in more of her work. So I picked up The White Book. Oh, let me say, I saw this at the Incheon Airport and I was gonna buy it and I was just standing around, moping around about, oh, should I buy it? Should I save my money? I'm going to another country. I should probably save my money, that kind of thing. And then I realized that like my flight wasn't departing from Terminal 2. 
<laughs> two. It's departing from terminal one. So I was just like, I can't think about this right now. I can't pick up this book. I gotta go. So I like ran and thank God I did because I would have had to wait like another 15 or so minutes for the shuttle bus to take me to terminal one. Anyway, huge mess. Glad I avoided that. And glad I did not pick that up then, but glad I picked it up now. Really short like this, and there's pictures. I don't even know what this is about, but it's a meditation on color, beginning with a simple list of white things. It is a book about mourning, rebirth, and the tenacity of the human spirit. Stunning investigation of the fragility, beauty, and strangeness of life. Love that. So also translated by Deborah Smith. And again, really interesting because Hong Kong like trusts so much in Deborah Smith's translation, adaptation of Hong Kong's work. So it's like really, really fascinating to see. That's 37 minutes on all of those books. I'm gonna go now. Oh, um, it was a gloomy, it was just raining. As soon as I turned on the camera, all this light decided to come in. But I was gonna make a comment about like how my room is like always dark. So I'm like in this cave constantly of just like no sunlight. And I get enough sunlight. It's just, I always have laundry hanging. So it blocks the sunlight, but also just it's, it's three in the afternoon right now, if anyone was curious, but I think there's a bit of light out now and I think I might step outside, who knows? But today felt nice because today felt like the first real day that I got to like do home stuff. Like, you know, laundry, tidying up, dusting, cleaning my mirrors, that kind of stuff. And yeah, it just felt nice. It felt nice. And I'm reading Ben Lerner's poetry and we're just, everything feels like a Sunday as it should be. And I am so grateful for that. You know what's funny is that most people forget that like you should be grateful that you're not sick. You know what I mean? Like when you're sick, you're sick and you're like, oh fuck, the world's awful because I'm sick. But we're never like, oh, I'm not sick today. I'm grateful for life. You know what I mean? So yeah, I'm, I'm grateful that I'm well and I'm enjoying this Sunday knowing that this is nice. I'm, I'm, I appreciate this. Okay. I don't know where that came from. Be well, do good work, keep in touch.